you're tuned in to the Eye on Global Politics radio show. Coming at you live from the heart of Oregon's Willamette Valley. Broadcasting around the world on eyeonglobalpolitics.com. Here's your host for the next hour, Dr. Paul F.J. Aranyas. And welcome. Thank you for joining me today on the Ion Global Politics radio show. And we're starting a new schedule now, and we're um, getting some studio cams, live studio cams right now, streaming on Facebook and LinkedIn and on uh, our website, ionglobalpolitics.com. So check that out, please. Uh, happy to have you here. We're going up to about 1245 today. And uh, right now we're talking about immigration, what's going on at the U.S. border. And it's, it's really a, a sad situation that's been going on for a long, long time. And I was just looking at the uh, what was happening last month with the sheriff reporting. Uh, it was a deputy sheriff, Mr. Wingate, that reported an order to drive migrants back into the river. Mr. Wingate described coming upon a group of 120 migrants, including young children and nursing mothers, on June 25th in rural Maverick County on the U.S. side of the Rio Grande. He said the group was exhausted, quote, quote, exhausted, hungry and tired, but was given orders to, quote, push the people back into the water to go to Mexico and get into our vehicles and leave. According to Mr. Wingate, he and another trooper, this is a state Texas Texas state trooper, he and another trooper decided that this was not the correct thing. Thank goodness it was not the correct thing to do uh, with the very re- real potential of exhausting people and drowning them. And the group, he said, was later assisted and processed by the border. But this is what's going on at the border constantly. People are dying on equivalent of a medium to large size commercial airliner dying in the desert every single year, year after year. And to see videos of Border Patrol dumping out water, just dumping out water that's being left by activists, uh, is is a, is sad beyond belief. It's sad beyond belief, and um, it's not all Border Patrol, I'm, I'm sure of it, but just like police officers in this country that abuse their authority you have border patrol officers that are that are sadistic out there that are abusing their authority that are preying on innocent migrants trying to seek a better life trying to seek asylum and it's uh quite disgusting and what what's the point why do you care well number one if you are a christian Let's just take it at that. If you believe in Jesus Christ, and there's 2 billion Christians out there, plus 2.3 billion Christians, 1.3 billion Catholics, you should care because you are instructed to care for the least of these, to welcome the stranger. And I'm going to read directly from Matthew 25. Then he shall say to them also that shall be on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me not to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me not to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you covered me not. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they shall say, They shall answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see thee hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to thee? Then he shall answer to them, saying, Amen, I say to you, as long as you did not did not do to one of the least of these least, neither did you do it unto me. And these shall go into everlasting punishment. But the just into everlasting, life everlasting. And if you look at the migrant situation on the border, it encapsulates 
all of these. For I was hungry. Migrants are hungry on the border. They're traveling through treacherous, treacherous conditions with little to eat, little to nothing to eat. Arriving at your doorstep, famished. They're thirsty. They're dying of thirst, literally in the desert. Literally in the American desert, they are dying of thirst. I was thirsty and you gave me not to drink. I was a stranger and you took me not in. Now, if you look at the Greek, the Greek word stranger, it's, you can substitute in, in alien, whatever word, I don't like that word, alien, foreigner, immigrant, it fits perfectly. It is synonymous in the Greek when Jesus says, we, I was a stranger and you took me not in. I was an immigrant and you took me not in. It means the exact same thing. And as we know, the Holy Family were immigrants. They fled to Egypt. They fled to Egypt. And the Blessed Mother, St. Joseph, and the baby Jesus were a migrant family. I was sick. Migrants are arriving exhausted and sick uh, from the journey. I was in prison. They're being imprisoned on the border in wire cages, families being separated. So as you can see, if you are a Christian, if you are a, a Christian, let's start there. Because that encompasses two billion people plus on this planet, then you have a direct responsibility. Because your responsibility as a citizen of, of God, as a citizen of heaven, it becomes before your, your national nationality. It comes before your, your passport. You're am an American citizen, but you're a, a, a citizen of heaven, a citizen of, of, of God, a, God a, ch- a child of God. And you are called to obey a direct Command, a deme- a, your duty to care for the least of these. Now, if you're, if you're a Muslim or a Jew or another faith or Hindu or Buddhist, each one of these faiths have, have their, their tenets, their, 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 their ethical values in their, in their scriptures and their writings. But if we just concentrate just right now, just as an exercise, for the two billion Christians on this world, if they put their values into practice, which have, of course, in history, never been the case because we've had the Crusades and we've had horrible atrocities done in the name of religion, of all religions, Christianity is no exception, obviously. The treatment of the Native Americans, the treatment of the uh, racism, the colonialism, slavery although religion was also used to abolish slavery. So you have the the good and the bad when it comes to that. But the actual teachings, never mind the perversion by the people, the actual teachings of Christ are clear, fundamentally clear. They're just, there is no room to maneuver on that. Now, I know there's some people that that are saying, well, uh, in, in Peter or, or in Romans, they say you must obey the governing authorities, and they try to tie that into immigration and, and obeying the immigration laws. First of all, that is must be looked at within the context of the early Christians and their 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 status as a persecuted minority within the Roman Empire, where they had no say. But the law became a positivist, uh, uh, legal positivism came in the 19th century. It came in the 19th century, and it uh, said whatever the sovereign says is law is law. Whatever the state says is law, whoever makes up the law as a human being is law. And that uh, was the prevailing legal theory from the 19th century, mid-19th century, until today. The only thing is it ran into a huge problem when you had Adolf Hitler killing 6 million Jews and uh, creating World War II, which killed 60 million people. 
And the Nazis went before the jury, the, the judges at the Nuremberg trials and said, hey, we didn't do anything wrong, they said, because we were operating according to our own laws, which are culturally specific to Germany, to the Third Reich. And the, the prosecutors at Nuremberg knew they had a problem. They could not operate based on American law or British law or Soviet law, they, they knew that under legal positivism, everything was relative. It was a relative. There were no absolute truths that said this was right or this was wrong. It was according to culture, according to what the sovereign said. So they had to come up with some supernatural, uh, supernational ideals enshrined in the Declaration of Human Rights that went above national law that said these are basic basic principles of human rights. And we will talk more about this in, in future uh, coming uh, shows, but the thing is to have an absolute ethic, you need transcendence. You cannot have an uh, ethic uh, uh, of human rights from within humanity that bubbles up from within fallible human beings. It, it just can't happen. Wittgenstein knew that. Jean-Jacques Rousseau knew that. If you look at uh, a lot of, even some of the uh, most famous atheistic writers knew that, that problem. That water does not rise above its own level. You cannot pull yourself up by the bootstraps. And so you need transcendent ethic. And for Christians, we got that with the revelation of, the New Testament with Christ Jesus coming to earth and as, as, as in the form of a human being and telling us how to live, how to operate our day-to-day affairs by affirming that we are made in the likeness and image of God, by The very fact that we have justification, a fellowship with God, so shows how important human beings are, that we are called to fellowship with God, that we are not just a, an animal. We are made in the likeness and image of God, and therefore we are called to treat our fellow image bearers with dignity and human rights. And this is the essence of human rights, because if you look at the preamble of the Declaration of Human Rights, where it says the inherent dignity, or and when any time someone talks about inalienable rights, inalienable means they can't be taken away. And if they can't be taken away, uh, then these are we're talking about something transcendent because human beings can take anything away from anything. Jewish people had their rights completely taken away by the Third Reich. Africans uh, had their rights taken away by white slaveholders that put them in the bottoms of ships and shipped them off for chattel, chattel slavery. So, um, in order to have a, a, a transcendent eth- an ethic, you need transcendence. And so, that is why you must pay attention. That is the backing. Very briefly, we can go further, deeper into it, but for why Matthew 25 is is the real deal, is so important. Uh, faith comes, of course, faith as, as Christians, as, as Catholics, faith is, uh, is at the underlying, you have, one has to have, have faith, but it is black and white in, 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 when it comes to ethics of human rights on how you should treat your fellow image bearer of God. And so the Catholic bishops over in, in, in Texas, the Texas Catholic bishops are condemning, have condemned this report uh, of, of orders given to state troopers to push people back into the river. And they're using Constantine, Constantina wire, which rips the flesh apart. They're putting this boundary within the, in the middle of the Rio Grande that Mexico has called illegal. Texas is doing that, and the, the U.S. DOJ has sued the Texas uh, state.
state government for for some of these actions. But the Texas Conference of Catholic Bishops responded to these incidents by Trooper Wingate. And they said, these reports stir our hearts again for the plight of our sisters and brothers who are seeking a better life. The bishop said, these mothers, fathers, children, and others are doing what anyone would do to find a better life. They have moved to secure honest work and a safe community. The fact that they were born in a place which could not provide these basic human rights does not give anyone the right to treat them inhumanely. These reports represent the very worst of the U.S. immigration system, which dehumanizes the vulnerable and desperate people caught within it, who seek safety within our borders. Anna Gallagher, the executive director director of Catholic League Immigration Network, Inc., said in a statement, People of faith and conscience cannot look away from the fact that these actions are done by government employees in our name. Ms. Gallagher said, Either we believe that all people bear untouchable dignity, or we don't. Permitting these despicable behavior, uh, this despicable behavior, behavior denies that truth and rejects the deepest principles of our Catholic faith and our nation's values. The Texas bishops requested prayers for our brothers and sisters experiencing the harsh realities of this journey and for all who encounter them. And there are a lot of people working at the border, organizations to try to save lives. And, you know, yet, yet you have the Republicans, a, a number of Republicans in Congress. This was from the end of 2022 and an ongoing Accusing Catholic Charities, a made it's the humanitarian arm of the Catholic Church in the world. Accusing Catholic Charities of breaking the law in its border response. The Catholic Charities responded by saying, As our nation grapples with escalating turmoil at the southwestern border of the United States and a highly charged political environment, it is incredibly disturbing for Catholic Charities the domestic humanitarian arm of the U.S. Catholic Church, to be accused of violating federal laws, fueling the dramatic increase in migrants crossing the border and inhibiting immigration enforcement by facilitating the transport of migrants to the nation's interior. The, The Ministry of Care provided to migrants by Catholic Charities has been ongoing across multiple administrations since our founding in 1910, the agency said. To care for sick people who are at risk, including the vulnerable people on the move, is a part of the fabric of the global Catholic Church and is mandated by the gospel. It is mandated by the gospel. That is clear. Black and white. Black and white. You don't need to be a a theologian to understand that. I mean, the, uh, biblical scripture needs to be interpreted for context. Hermeneutics, it needs to be it needs to be interpreted within context. This is clear, black and white. There is no misinterpreting the message of Christ Jesus in Matthew 25. It is, it is not shrouded in, in some kind of where it can be misinterpreted and, and taken out of context. Or It is clear and it stretches from age to age and it will be clear 2,000 years from now and it was clear 2,000 years ago. For when I was hungry, you gave me not to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me not to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you covered me not. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they shall answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see thee hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to thee? Then he shall answer them, saying, Amen, I say to you, as long as you did it not to one of these least, the ones at the border, the poorest of these, the the, the immigrants, the, the children that are suffering at the U.S. border. Amen, I say to you, as long as you did not did it not to one of these least, neither did you do it to me. And these last shall go into the everlasting punishment, but the just into everlasting life. You are rejecting 
the face of God when you demonize immigrants, when you demonize those suffering to come to this country to have a better life, to escape persecution, to escape violence, to escape extreme poverty. You are persecuting the face of Christ. You are persecuting Christ himself. Now, one may say, well, you have to have borders. It goes even deeper. It goes even deeper. Because guess what? This country, the United States, my country, stole much of the land from Mexico. Not 500 years ago, not 800 years ago, but 150 years, some odd years ago. And through devious uh, racist policies and... We can go into the history. That's a whole show unto itself with James K. Polk and American settlers coming in on rented land that the Mexico Mexican Mexican government rented land to American settlers, which they did not want to be under Mexican government and fought the Mexican government to become its own Republic of Texas. And then Polk wanted California, so he brought in soldiers and disputed territory, territory knowing, knowing that they would be killed and captured and use that as a pretext to start, start the war with Mexico, the Mexican-American War, which took California and Arizona and, and, and a bunch of other territories. So if you look at the history, this is, it's, uh, you know, as, as a lot of people say, the border didn't they didn't cross the border. The border crossed them. So if you, you're talking about justice and law and what's what's right, well, there's a lot of theft there. I mean, talk about that situation. You can talk about Hawaii. You can talk about a lot of situations. We're not going to go into that in this episode because it's it, it goes too deep. It, it requires its own discussion. But if you have something to say on this, give me a, a call at one 871 paul one eight seven seven eight seven one Paul. I'm uh, I'll take voicemails now. I'm not directly taking calls at this time because we are not screening at this time, and I, I don't know what what we'll get if we if if, if I open that up directly to calls uh, with this subject, especially and the vitriol that is out there uh, with with a lot of hate in in, in people's hearts, and so we're going to screen that just for uh, efficiency's sake. But give me a call at 871-877-871, Paul. And uh, so uh, they continue to find bodies in the Rio Grande. They just found uh, two bodies floating in the Rio Grande near near Texas. Uh, and you have Republicans calling for the bombing of Mexico. That's the uh, apparently the build the new wall. Is, is bomb the Mexicans. That's the new slogan. And there's a column from, um, from the end of June in the Los Angeles Times by uh, John Jean Guerrero detailing that. And basically they're using fentanyl as an excuse to try to whip up uh, support for military intervention into Mexico. It's all, <laughs> you know, they never want to look at the root causes. Uh, you know, fentanyl drug, uh, drug cartels, that's a, very serious problem. It's it's not to be taken lightly. There's a lot of people dying in Mexico. The only problem is that people on this side of the border in political power don't want to take responsibility for the fueling of this situation. The majority of guns that the, the drug cartels are operating with are smuggled from U.S. gun companies. That's right. The majority, the majority of the drug traffickers are on this side of the border, are American. And so Mexico has stringent gun laws, stringent gun laws. And uh, the only way these drug cartels are being armed is because American weapons, mostly made in America, sometimes in, in, in other countries, third party countries, but American companies are having their weapons. They're, they're being smuggled to the drug cartels. They're they're being smuggled to the drug cartels, and John Guerrero 
talks about this uh, and talks about, in particular, it's, excuse me, Jean, Jean Guerrero. And she talks about Representative Joaquin Castro, Democrat of Texas, who has been sounding the alarm about these uh, Republican pr- proposals to lay the groundwork for an invasion of Mexico. And <clears throat> uh, Castro is saying there's literally a black hole in this piece of public policy that doesn't address the American side at all. He was referring to the U.S. demand for drugs and government do- data showing U.S. citizens represent the vast majority of drug traffickers despite the popular perception of cartels as Mexican. Republican legislation also ignores the fact that cartels in Mexico operate almost exclusively with guns smuggled in from the U.S. in defiance of Mexico's gun laws, some of the most stringent in the world. And Guerrero says, imagine if Mexico were planning to invade the U.S. to attack American gun companies, which make products known to kill tens of thousands of Mexicans each year and which refuse to take basic steps to, to stop gun smuggling. Instead, Mexico is merely suing the gun manufacturers. If we really, really want to fight criminal organizations and drug traffickers, we need to, de- to, to decrease their firepower. Alejandro Celorio Alcantara says, who is legal advisor to Mexico's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, And Castro introduced a bill that would curb gun trafficking to Latin America and the Caribbean, the the America's Regional Monitoring of Arms Sales Act, the Armas Act. So far, it has no Republican co-sponsors, although Castro hopes to change that soon. GOP leaders seem to prefer a strategy that will create more war-torn regions from which people are displaced and help transnational cartels to expand their territory, as often happens when the U.S. military Interferes south of the border, Guerrero says. And and I agree with her. And it, of course, it's not just the Republicans because the, the Democratic Party are is complicit. Of course, President Obama was called the deporter in chief. These policies go from administration to administration with some variance. I mean, Trump did some horrible things with the separation of children. And now they're separating fathers at the border from, from their children and wives right now. As of uh, this week. And you have to ask yourself again. Governor Abbott. Is a professed Catholic. And you have. All these Christians in this country. uh, Claiming to to be Christian. And I'm not judging their souls. But I'm pointing out the basic hypocrisy. That a lot of this so-called Christianity. Uh, proclamation of Christianity seems to me to be a social club. To be a social club because the Christian uh, uh, social thought, the Christian thinking, the thought, the actual teaching of Christianity is 180 degrees from what they're advocating here at the border. Again, welcome the stranger. Welcome the immigrant. Welcome the foreigner. That is the word for stranger in the Greek means the same thing. And so uh, we're, uh, let, me, let me play for you a clip about uh, something uh, that some of you may not know. Some of you may very well know. Something called the Bracero Program after World War II. Actually, it started in 1942 and lasted till 1964. This is from NBC News, giving a little overview of what the program was about. The Second World War created a huge labor shortage at home. One way the government tried to deal with it was the Bracero program, which allowed American businesses to hire thousands of temporary guest workers from Mexico. We have this moment of increased national production in the United States, men leaving to go to war, but at the same time increased production in terms of building ships, building airplanes, creating enough food, just getting the economy up and running to deal with the war effort. One of the things that is not getting done is that crops are not being picked efficiently at the precise right moments that they need to be done, particularly in the American Southwest, California, and the Imperial Valley of Texas. 
The Bracero program, established by the U.S. and Mexican governments in 1942, allowed Mexican nationals to legally enter the U.S. for up to six months to work as contract laborers, mainly on farms. Mexican men would register to come across the border to work for a specific time period to do this sort of picking work. Bracero means farmhand in Spanish. The program merely legalized a migration that had been going on for some time. The men spent long, back-breaking days in the fields, and in return, they had a steady paycheck and free housing. But even by standards of the time, their treatment was often considered inhumane. It's a mixed program from the perspective that it does bring thousands of men in. There were a number of instances of abuses where employers were not paying what they were supposed to be paying. They weren't housing workers in the ways that the federal government had promised the Mexican government um, that they would be housed. So many Mexicans participated in the program that by the end of the war, they formed the second largest minority in the nation after African Americans. The program continued for years after World War II because growers said they couldn't find enough Americans willing to work on their farms. In 1964, with mechanization of farming on the rise, the program was finally phased out, but not before four and a half million Mexican nationals had been part of it. The Bracero program may have ended, but labor shortages for certain jobs persist in the United States, along with the debate about Mexican workers. And so what you see from really World War II to today is this constant ebb and flow of policy and ideology about the place of these transient Mexican workers in the U.S. economy. And they're vital to portions of the U.S. economy, and the question becomes politically how you deal with that labor issue. So that's an interesting program from 1942 to 1964 where the government needed workers, and they still need workers. We still have a labor shortage. And they opened it up to migrant workers for temporary contracts. And so there is a solution to this. Uh, there is a, a humane solution, and we're not going to go into all the solutions. I have some ideas. You may have some ideas. But what is uh, not a solution is what is happening right now on the border. What we can rule out completely as inhumane is the current policy. The current policy of building walls, of allowing people to die by the hundreds in the desert, the people being cut up and, and, and their flesh being torn uh, apart by razor wire, um, barricades being put in the middle of the Rio Grande, demonizing hardworking people. Look, there's criminality everywhere. Take a look at our cities in this country. Take a look at, look at any American cities. You cannot cast a, a stereotype because there is a criminal amongst a group of people or a, a, a one or two or however many, uh, a small percentage, and, and, and castigate and blanket everybody as, as criminals. Otherwise, everybody in Los Angeles would be a criminal. Everyone in New York would be a criminal. Everyone in Miami would be a criminal. Everyone in Chicago or Seattle would be a criminal, a bunch of criminals. And that's not the case. There are some criminals that operate in any populace. That's logical. I don't even think I have to say that. But apparently in this day and age, you have to say that because you have people just using racial rhetoric to to demonize a whole group of people that are hardworking, that are just trying to survive. And, you know, the history of empire in, in Latin America that goes back to uh, goes back to decades and decades and centuries, quite frankly, of the United States uh, uh, oppressing and propping up dictators and uh, oppressing uh, people through 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 military juntas and which is and through economic policies like NAFTA causes that immigration. Most people would like to stay in their own country, but the fact is, if you want to look how successful a democracy is, look at the surrounding countries. And the fact is that the United States has not wanted to export democracy. What they've exported is what we have, is an oligarchy, a plutocracy. And so that becomes the uh, the mode of government in the surrounding countries because that is what the United States, the power broker in the region, has demanded and when people have risen up to to change that, they've been crushed by 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 Washington and Washington's proxies, the Contras, 
you know, the the uh, the Batista's uh, minions in Miami, the wherever. Cuba was one place that it was not successful, and so they punished them with the embargo for for decade after decade, and it's still being punished with an embargo. But to give you the kind of thinking, let's to to to, to think of the kind of thinking that we're dealing with here are are not people that really want to solve this issue, that do not want to do the humane thing. We're dealing with people that are interested in power and finance, and they're using ignorant people, ignorant people in this country, to do their bidding. And how do they do that? They whip up fear, they whip up nationalism. And you can see that with this young Australian girl that... um, I don't know, she was on TikTok or something. And she was traveling around, you know, it's kind of a travel blog, that type thing, I suppose. And she made a observation that there were too many flags in the United States, that she was in Kansas or something like that. And she made a couple other critical remarks about being unlivable and the weather in Kansas. Okay, she, whatever. You may not like it. You may like it. It's, it's, she's free to have her opinion you go to a country, you go to Europe, you go to the Middle East, wherever. You you go on your social media and you say, I like this, I didn't like this, I, I like this food, I didn't like this thing about the culture, whatever. It's someone's opinion about their travel experience. And so what happens is Governor Abbott retweets it. I guess he put it on Twitter or whatever, or she also copied it on Twitter. I don't know the exact details on which platform. I know it was on TikTok. And uh, so he retweets it, and along with the retweet, he says, go back to Australia. He tells her to go back to Australia. Now, I don't know exactly how old she is. I saw her picture. She looks like she's a teenager, maybe 20 years old, maybe she's 17. Now, somewhere around those, those age, that, that age, maybe she's in college, at the most, 21, 22 Probably more like 18. Anyway, she deletes all her accounts because she's getting all this vitriol coming back about uh, the American flag. You don't like it, get out, all that. You know, the same old, same old, same old, you know. But she made an observation. Now, from my opinion, I mean, this is a, there's a lot of hop- hypocrisy there with the, the so-called patriotism on the flag because if you look at the flag, and some people, a number of people I saw when I just briefly perused this, this you know, bullying and gang, ganging up. And, you know, to be fair, the girl knew what she was doing when she you go on social media and you put something out there. You know what you're going to get. You know what you're going to get these days. So you got to be prepared for that. But that doesn't excuse the, the, the governor of Texas and the juvenile behavior of everyone else, but you you got to deal with reality and you you know what you're going to get these days and the level of intelligence out there among on social media generally speaking you know that i know that everybody knows that but they're going after her about the flag and just to look at the flag i mean where are all these patriots when the flag is tattered and driving on somebody's car in three pieces being shredded by the rain or being worn as underwear, or being left up at night. Now, if you are really, really concerned about the flag, then you should know the flag code, and you should know that to respect the flag. You know, some people said talked about World War II and their relatives. Fine, that's fine and good. But if they're really that concerned as the symbol of that deep of a symbol of a flag, representing uh, people that have died and things like that then they should know that they're supposed to put the flag up at like 6 a.m. in the morning, sun up, and take it down at 6 p.m. and take it down and not leave it out in the rain, not wear it as underwear. Before NFL games, not lay it flat across the field. They passed a resolution years ago in Congress describing what you should do with the flag, and it does and says, do not leave it horizontally across the, uh, the ground like they do when they wave it to whip up fervor at NFL games. Do not wear it on your head like a bandana. Do not wear it as pants. Do not wear it as a bra. Put it on a flagpole. Put it up at 6 a.m. Take it down at sundown. 
fold it, have a nice ceremony, fold it, go back out 6 a.m. and put it back up. Now, for me, I, I, I don't think it, I, I think it's become a symbol of, oh, I'm American, you're not. It's become a political sy- symbol in which it does injustice to any flag when you're using it as a weapon of exclu- an exclusionary weapon that goes against the principles, the stated principles that have never been fully put into practice of this country. Give me your tired, give me your huddle masses. When it goes against those very principles, then it is not patriotic at all. You're not being patriotic by using the flag as a weapon. You're not being patriotic by symbolically by letting it being tattered and, and, and treating it as a dust rag and let it fly in your car in the rain and the hailstorms and leaving it up all night in the rain. You're not being patriotic when you you wear it as a bra or, or underwear or, or a handkerchief or a kerchief. It's not meant to be worn as an article of clothing. Okay, now I'm not, uh, I don't want to judge anybody. I don't want to, but I'm talking to those who are judging everybody else to a young girl that comes to, to visit this country at age 20 or 19 and makes an observation that there are too many flags. Quite frankly, there are too many flags. For once, people don't know how to be reverent or actually they're using it as a weapon. Point two, they're disrespecting the flag all over the place. That's right, because you, they don't know their own flag code. They do not know their own flag code or, or the policies that are the recommendations to how to use a flag. Now, I always said, you know, I, I, I don't believe in putting that, putting that, the, the flag on a house. I think it, it makes it look like a, 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 a post office or, or a school and it's become such a, a, a symbol used as a weapon. To, to say, I'm American, you're not, and to demonize immigrants. And that's what it's become because that's how it's used. And you can see that's how it's even used against this young Australian girl. Who are these people to say that this girl is being disrespectful to them when they're not even being respectful themselves? Judge not lest thee be judge. I think a little live and let live and let a young girl say what she wants on her social media page about her observa- observations. Granted, the girl should know what day and age we're living in. She had to delete all her, her her accounts because of the vitriol, but you know you have to be aware of what time it is in this world with the, the people that we're dealing with and the, the level of intellectual debate that you're dealing with, but it doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it right that, that people are... are going after people like that, and it just contributes to bullying. That's what it is. It's contributing to bullying, and now you have political leaders that are contributing to bullying. And quite frankly, we need political leaders that will go against bullying, that will uplift people, even people that they disagree with, even people that they disagree with. Okay, we're out of time. It's 1245 p.m. here on the West Coast. In the Oregon, in Oregon's Willamette Valley, I thank you so much for joining me for this discussion. I look forward to any of your comments. On uh, you can email me at comments at ionglobalpolitics.com or you can shoot me a voicemail at one eight seven seven eight seven one Paul one eight seven seven eight seven Paul. That's seven two eight five. The last four digits. Thank you so much, and as always, keep the faith. You're tuned in to Eye on Global Politics Radio, coming at you live from the heart of Oregon's Willamette Valley, broadcasting around the world on eyeonglobalpolitics.com.